I had the coolest job that any electrical engineer could ever have on the ground crew for Solar Impulse 2, the first solar powered airplane to fly around the world only using the power of the sun. IEEE USA has given me a competitive edge because of their support system. It is so much easier doing something and being out of your comfort zone when you have someone there saying, you got this. IEEE USA is more than just a network, it's a family. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to today's IEEE USA live stream webinar, Intellectual Property 101. I'm your host, Jonathan Cho. IEEE USA's goal is to create programming that is valuable, relevant, and of interest to you. We'll be sending a short survey to all registrants after this event and would love your feedback. We value your opinions and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes and share your thoughts. Today's webinar is at first in a series in a partnership with the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Our presenter for today is Elizabeth Doherty of the USPTO. As the Eastern Regional Outreach Director of the USPTO, Elizabeth carries out the strategic direction of the organization and is responsible for leading its East Coast stakeholder engagement, ensuring the USPTO's initiatives and programs are tailored to the region's unique ecosystem of industries and stakeholders. Without further ado, let me present our speaker. Welcome, Elizabeth. It's such a pleasure to be here today with this robust audience. Um, as Jonathan said, my name is Elizabeth Doherty. I'm a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and I love to engage stakeholders. I love to provide education, information, and help to demystify the intellectual property process and system. We all live the lives we do because of patented technologies and trademark registered goods and services. We wouldn't recognize the lives we lead without those. So it is my pleasure to spend the next hour with you. Uh, I hope we're gonna have the opportunity for questions. And I know some of you have supplied questions in advance of our conversation today. Um, I don't know if you know, but today is April 20th and it is National Lookalike Day. Now, why do I mention that? Not only because you may be enjoying it today um, and always wondering if there's someone out there that looks just like you. Um, according to many, it's uh, probably a Bradley Cooper or a Beyonce, but in all likelihood, it's a normal person you'll never meet. With 7.4 billion people on the planet, there's bound to be someone else out there who shares your features. Now, while we all would love to know if we've got a doppelganger out there, the reason I bring up National Lookalike Day is this is juxtaposed against intellectual property. When we talk about patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, we are looking for people to not look alike. We are looking for products and services to distinguish themselves and to distinguish themselves using the vehicles of intellectual property. So just a fun introduction to our topic today. I know talking to the IEEE and its membership you are all familiar with patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, although maybe today is an opportunity to do a little bit of a deeper dive to distinguish what those different types of intellectual property are, how they're used, what they protect, and how one secures them. Um, again, I know IEEE is a proponent of intellectual property because, in fact, over 124 inductees to the National Inventors Hall of Fame the National Inventors Hall of Fame, which recognizes significant inventors, inventors who have a US patent, a US patent which has changed the world. Of the over 600 inductees to the National Inventors Hall of Fame, 124 of those inductees have received IEEE medals, field awards, or were fellows of the IEEE. So quite impressive. Uh, and we love to see our frequent flyers that work and participate in the IEEE. So we welcome this collaboration and welcome your participation in today's program, as well as the entirety of the series. With that, we are going to jump right into our materials, and I hope that you enjoy them. I hope this spurs some curiosity on your part and also spurs the idea that perhaps you are already creating intellectual property, which should be protected, or perhaps you are likely to do so in the future. So with that said, let's jump right into it. Today, we're going to be talking about intellectual property 101, really the basics of intellectual property. What is it? How does one secure it? What in fact is the US, in, uh, uh, the US Patent and Trademark Office? So it's my hope that this conversation is gonna whet your appetite to learn more. 
Just to provide you uh, with a slight disclaimer, uh, this does not constitute legal advice, and certainly our agency is here to help you with any questions or concerns about intellectual property protection. In our conversation today, in part, we are going to look at intellectual property from the business perspective. Looking at it from the 30,000 foot level, why is intellectual property important for a business? And should it be something in, when one is creating a business plan, should it be considered? And I'll give you the, sh the short and quick answer. And the answer is yes. For business owners, creating and protecting intellectual property should be forefront in their business plan. It should be something thought of from the very get-go, and it should be considered and evaluated throughout the entrepreneurial process. When starting, building, and growing a business, intellectual property should always be part of that thought process. Shouldn't be a rainy day project that you get to when you have more time or more money. Because unfortunately, sometimes delaying and protecting your intellectual property can in fact preclude you from protecting your intellectual property. So again, what is intellectual property? We're gonna do a dive on that today. Talking about patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. We're also going to do a brief introduction into some of the robust and remarkable resources of the US Patent and Trademark Office that we have available to inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs like yourself. So as I said and suggested, intellectual property strategy is in fact a business strategy. It's something that should be thought of along every part of the entrepreneurial journey. As you enter that innovation ecosystem, start about start thinking about intellectual property, start developing your intellectual property portfolio. And why is that significant? It's significant because intellectual property, like real property, can make your company attractive to investors and buyers. For any of us who have ever seen the show Shark Tank, we know one of those first questions that is always asked by the sharks is, have you protected your intellectual property? Do you have any patents? Do you have any trademarks? Because they recognize the value that it can bring to a business. By protecting your intellectual property and putting the public on notice that you have protected your intellectual property, you can also help to deter infringement lawsuits. By putting it out there into the public, by saying, I have a circle with an R, a circle with a C, using your patent number on uh, commercialized goods, you alert the public that you have protected your invention, you have protected your brand, and that they should not be making use of it without your permission. IP can similarly increase leveraging power. Just as we said, it makes it attractive to investors and buyers. Those who are looking to create mergers or acquisitions will also see intellectual property as part of your bottom line, as part of your financial package. It's a property right that can add value, and it is global. It is global in the sense, certainly, that there are intellectual property systems around the globe, but it is also global because very few of us today are working only in a local environment. Most of us, in part because of the internet, are now working on a global platform as we promote and commercialize products and services. So what is intellectual property? And I apologize to those of you who are very savvy in this area that this may be a, a very simple conversation, but I think it's important to start here, to start at the basics, to create that building block for those who may not be familiar with the concept. Intellectual property can be juxtaposed against real property. Real property is a concept we can all appreciate because many of us own it. It may be a house, a car, a boat, some type of tangible property which has value, it has financial value. It can be bought, it can be sold, it can be licensed, it can be given away or even um, left to one's heirs. Intellectual property very similarly has those same uh, opportunities, but it is property of the mind. It is creative property created by you as an individual or perhaps, perhaps by a number of individuals working together creative property, creative property of the mind. And it is what is protected by the US Patent and Trademark Office, the US Copyright Office, and then trade secrets by the Uniform Trade Secret Act, and sometimes by contract law as well. So what is the US Patent and Trademark Office? Well, I'm very proud to say, not how only has it been my one and only for the past 30 years, but it is a remarkable federal agency. We are perhaps the oldest, if not the oldest, a federal agency 
beginning our work in 1790. Uh, the first office uh, was headed up by none other than Thomas Jefferson and several other remarkable individuals, Henry Knox, Edmund Randolph. These individuals were the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, and uh, the uh, uh, Secretary, uh, the, my apologies, the Attorney General. These individuals served as the first board of patent examiners, the first board of patent reviewers who reviewed those first and early applications. Today, we are a 13,000 person government agency housed under the Department of Commerce. Our headquarters is located in Alexandria, Virginia, and we have regional offices in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose. We have a remarkable workforce of dedicated civil service employees who work across the nation because we lead the federal government in telework. Even prior to the pandemic, we led the government as the gold standard in telework and have employees working in nearly all of the 50 states. Um, our work is to uh, issue US patents and to federally register US trademarks. Uh, we are certainly the engine of the economy and we are America's innovation agency. We like to say that we saw tomorrow, that we saw tomorrow yesterday uh, because we truly are on the cutting edge of technology. Just to, again, give you a glimpse into the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the significance of our work and the role that you play as stakeholders, as the role of creators of intellectual property. As I said, our agency is nearly 13,000 persons. Of that 13,000 persons, over 8,000 8, are trained engineers and scientists who review patent applications every day of the week. I bet you many of them are IEEE members. We also have nearly 700 trademark examining attorneys, as well as a number of administrative patent judges and administrative trademark judges. To give you a, a glimpse into what our filings are like, in the last fiscal year alone, we received over 650,000 patent applications and issued over 375 uh, patents uh, issued. We received nearly 1 million trademark applications and issued over 400. 30,000 trademark registrations. That's a lot of creativity, um, which I think we should see as a real positive. Now, of course, as you can imagine, that can cause delays in people receiving their intellectual property rights and receiving their patent or receiving their trademark registration, but we are working towards improving that each and every day. We do it through hiring, through adding fire firepower to our team, but additionally, by also uh, always working to make our systems, processes, and procedures more efficient. So know that we're working on that because we don't want there to be a delay in you receiving your intellectual property protection. Not only are we perhaps the oldest government agency, the work of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is in fact infused in the U.S. Constitution. Our founding fathers were so smart to recognize that in order to create a strong and industrialized nation, we needed to protect the rights of authors and inventors and inventors for a set period of time to allow them to enjoy the benefit of their hard work and labors. So as you can see, we are written into the Constitution at Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. This is known as the Patent and Copyright Clause. Trademarks are also found within the U.S. Constitution and they are found in the Commerce Clause. Uh, what is significant about this part of the Constitution is that we shall promote the progress of science by securing for limited times. And in our conversation today, we're gonna to talk about what those limited times are. Limited times for authors and inventors. Now, outside of those limited times, the intellectual property then becomes part of the public domain. But we'll talk about their, that more significantly as we proceed through our slides today. So what are the types of intellectual property? Well, there are four basic types. And oftentimes these four basic types are created by any one individual or organization as they pursue uh, a commercial gain. And they may work together to create what we call an intellectual property portfolio. So there are patents, as you can imagine, they are uh, administered and issued by the US Patent and Trademark Office. They are a protector of new and inventive ideas. Um, but we're going to get into that concept of can you patent an idea? Well, so let's circle back to that here very shortly. Trademarks. 
Trademarks protect the and identify the origin of goods and services. Those are also administered by the US Patent and Trademark Office. But I will give you a tip ahead that trademarks can also be protected by state law and by common law. So very interesting. Copyrights protect creative expressions st stored in a tangible medium. Uh, copyrights are issued by the US Copyright Office, which is part of the Library of Congress. I should say, however, that the US Patent and Trademark Office uh, assists the administration in the development of copyright policy. So the US Patent and Trademark Office does have a role to play in copyrights. Trade secrets protect any information that is valuable and kept confidential. And as I mentioned, are protected by the Uniform Trade Secrets Act and oftentimes by contract law within an individual business. So let's do a dive on each one of these. Let's get to know what each one of these protects, how one obtains them, what is the duration for each, and let's uh, take a look at each one and see how they interplay together. Before we do so though, let's take a quick example of how one might have a singular device which encompasses an IP portfolio, which again has multiple forms of intellectual property protecting that one commercialized device. Uh, here in this particular example, we are taking a cellular communication device, a cell phone, one that uh, probably many of us have in our hand right now or on the desk in front of us or in our back pocket or purse. As you can see in this particular example, there are trademarks, patents, copyrights, potentially trade secrets, and designs protected in this one form of intellectual property. Um, trademarks would cover the name, the name of the phone, the name of the brand, the name of perhaps some of the software that is present on the phone. Patents would protect the device itself. Its appearance could be protected by a design patent and the various elements, the complicated complex elements that form the technology behind that cellular communication device. Copyrights could protect the software code an instruction manual, uh, a number of things encompassing, uh, encompassed with, within that particular device. Trade secrets, it's hard to say because it is something that is kept secret. And we're gonna talk about that first and foremost here in just a moment. Designs can be protected again by design patents and can protect a variety of features, not only the external appearance of that phone. So just keep in mind, one might be creating an intellectual property portfolio. So this is where it would be incredibly helpful to have an intellectual property attorney who can advise you in whatever uh, undertaking you are uh, endeavoring to pursue. So let's talk about trade secrets first. And I love this exemplary slide because here's a couple of great examples of trade secrets and two that are commonly referred to. Um, trade secrets, as we know, and as we've just barely touched upon, they protect anything which provides financial value to a company and which can be maintained as a secret. So in these two particular examples, it's the recipe, the recipe for that KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken chicken. What makes it so good? What are those seven ingredients and spices? I guess we can only speculate. You know, could you reproduce that in your kitchen? Perhaps you could come close, but how would you ever know? Because they have been able to maintain that as a secret. For Google, it is their search algorithm that they have maintained as a secret. What is it that allows you to put in a few key search words and there are results returned that provide you with pertinent information? Well, it's tough to know because Google has been able to maintain that search algorithm as a trade secret. Algorithms, recipes are just two examples of what can be protected by a trade secret because trade secrets can be any commercially valuable proprietary information, business form information, formulas, um, potentially even something like a customer list that gives you a competitive advantage over your competitor, over another working in your field of endeavor. Trade secrets are not generally known and must be subject to reasonable efforts to preserve confidentiality. So this is where it behooves a company, it, behooves those who are producing that information, that valuable proprietary information to ascertain ways in which to keep it secret. Uh, it's often been speculated, and perhaps this is an urban legend, that Coca-Cola keeps their formula in a vault. Would that be a way of maintaining secrecy? Certainly. 
Another way is perhaps that no one employee of a company has every ingredient in the recipe uh, for whatever is being created, whether it's KFC chicken or Coca-Cola, perhaps the ingredients of the recipe are only known to separate individuals. Um, again, it is important that in, that information be maintained secret, and that is often done through employee to employee employer contract laws. What are some of the common ways to lose a trade secret? Secret, well, of course, reverse engineering and independent development are two of the most popular. Um, if cautioning someone uh, in creating a commercially available device, uh, know if your device can be reverse engineered. Is it visible to the consumer how that, that device operates, how the uh, parts of it uh, interact to one another to create the operation of the device, the manufacture of the device? Let's keep in mind, in order to be maintained as a trade secret, there must be something that can be kept secret. Um, so again, it's important to put in a preventative steps to uh, make sure that things do not become disclosed. Um, and and it, it, sometimes it simply happens. Sometimes there is someone out there that is just clever or even independent development, it happens. Um, the incredible value behind a trade secret is the potential duration of a trade secret. Because uh, there is no limit by law, if something continues to provide valuable, commercially valuable uh, access to a company and may, is maintained as a trade secret, the value of that trade secret can last forever. Whereas other forms of intellectual property have a limited period of time, as we saw in that language of the Constitution. So again, trade secrets have an incredible value or potential incredible value in part because of their possible duration. Let's move on to copyrights. Copyrights, as I said, are protected by the US Copyright Office, which is a part of the Library of Congress. Copyrights are a legal protection for the authors of original works of authorship. So what's important to know here is the term original works of authorship. And like trade secrets, copyrights can protect a wide array of things, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other intellectual works. And we've got another list coming up of just some of the examples of what is protected by a copyright. So what works are protected? Not only must they be original, the work must be in a fixed and tangible form of expression. That fixation need not be directly perceptible so long as it may be communicated with the aid of a machine or a device. So what this last point means is that that fixation can be in the form of uh, an electronic recordation. Perhaps you have fixed it in a, the tangible form of a, a thumb drive or a CD-ROM or you've stored in it, it in some other electronic medium. Um, but it must be fixed in a tangible form of expression. Uh, think about the example of a sculpture. Has it been fixed into clay or into ceramic? Um, there's, again, a number of things that can be protected by a copyright, and we're going to get to that list very shortly. So it must also be an original work, meaning that the work must be independently created by the author. Although there are something called derivative works where someone can take an existing work and perhaps change that to such a level that it becomes a derivative work, which can also potentially be protected by copyright. Now, it's interesting to note that the level of creativity is a relatively low bar. Uh, I'll give you a little piece of research homework here. There was once a large court case about whether one could copyright a phone book. I'll leave it up to you to find the answer to that question. So some of the categories of protected works include literary works, musical, sound recordings, dramatic works, choreographic works, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural, motion pictures, and architectural works. Um, a great opportunity to see some of these is a visit to the Library of Congress and to search their database. As I said, works from pre-existing uh, works, pre works include those derivative works and, in fact, perhaps compilations. If one were to uh, perhaps be a lover of poetry and one were to take copyrighted poems uh, that were on, let's say, for example, a particular theme, you love nature, and you want to take a number of your favorite nature poems and compile them into one work of nature poems, you might, in fact, be able to create a copyright of that compilation work. 
So what works are not protected? Well, as we said, it has to be an original work that is fixed in, an a, fixed in a tangible means. So if it is not fixed in a tangible form, not protected. Titles, names, familiar symbols or designs, mere variations of lettering, mere listings of ingredients or contents. What this latter point means is, can you copyright that grocery list that you wrote this morning? Probably not, except what if in that grocery list you did some doodlings, you added some artistic renderings, or perhaps in the sideline margin, you deciphered a creative recipe for what those uh, ingredients were going to create. Um, could you get a copyright? Perhaps. Uh, always giving that, uh, that cautious uh, legal analysis of perhaps. Uh, one cannot copyright ideas, procedures, concepts, principles, or works consisting entirely of common property, because in that instance, there is no original authorship. What are the terms of a copyright? As you know, we've just touched on trade secrets, which can potentially last forever as long as the information is maintained as a secret and provides commercial uh, uh, benefit to the company. Copyrights, however, have a limited duration, just as patents. Copyrights are good for the life plus the life of the author plus 70 years, meaning that the creator of that creative work can enjoy the benefit of their work, plus can provide it to their heirs for 70 years. So what are the exclusive rights to a copyright owner? By copywriting something, what does one uh, avail themselves of? You provide yourself with the exclusive right to reproduce the work, prepare derivative works, distribute copies, perform the work publicly, display the work publicly, and here's where the real money maker is, authorize others to do so, licensing your work or selling your work to others. So why register? And why do we even ask this question? Well, copyrights are something that we call self-authenticating. By merely create, creating that original work and placing it in a fixed and tangible medium, you have in fact secured a copyright for yourself. So if you wrote a letter today, if you wrote a poem today, if you created a sculpture today, you in fact already have a copyright in that work. However, by registering your copyrighted work with the US Copyright Office, you can take advantage of additional protections and opportunities. And that's what's discussed here in this slide. Registration puts others on notice of the copyright claim. It is required to file suit in federal court. It's prima facie evidence of validity of the copyright. It may be used, and this is very significant. This goes back to our doppelganger lookalike day. Registration may be recorded with the US Customs and Border Protection to help prevent importation of pirated, copyrighted products. People who are trying to, to, uh, to benefit from your work without your permission. Uh, again, statutory damages and attorney's fees may be claimed in court if you register your copyright, and it is certainly easier to license, collect royalties, and enforce rights outside of court. I know that uh, a couple of questions were submitted prior to today's conversation, and this might be a good point to hit them just very quickly. And one of which was someone asked, uh, I believe it uh, was one of our attendees today, they indicated that they were interested in using images posted by Google. Is this acceptable? In other words, if I find something on the internet, is it okay for me to copyright it? Can I snag a great looking image and use it in my presentation? The answer is hold on and wait a minute. The best practices for legally using Google images, always assume the image is protected by copyright. Just because you saw it on the internet doesn't mean it's free to use. Um, you should always um, try to use your own photos and images. Uh, you can use Creative Commons licensed images because oftentimes those are uh, put forth as ones that you can use. However, the caution there is to always read the license. Just because it says Creative Commons licensed image does not necessarily mean that it is free to use without taking it without looking at that license. You need to read its terms and conditions and see what it allows or not. Um, when Another way to be careful is to use images from stock photo agencies where you might purchase the items or uh, follow their license agreement. Always confirm the owner of the copyright in any image that you try to use. So again, in a nutshell, just because something is available on Google, available on the internet, do not assume that it is free to use. 
because many, many of those images are copyrighted and we want those artists and creators to be uh, protected. Uh, additionally, another question that came in on the same kind of topic was someone who said that they are interested in open source licenses. Well, let's start with what is an open source license? Uh, it is a license to, given to software that shares source code, which can be inspected or modified by anyone. By providing an open source license, the software developers give access to programmers so they can create changes to accommodate specific uses. Um, keep in mind, however, uh, open source licenses do not necessarily mean that that is free. A lot of people have the misconception that giving an open source software license means that software is free of charge. Open source licenses does not necessarily mean that. The concept is simply that an open source does not have, um, so to think that it does not have monetary complications could be uh, wrong. However, it depends on the developers whether they want to charge for the software or not. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, one should be cautious when looking to use any open source licenses or uh, to use any copyrighted information on the web, on the internet. All right, let's jump to trademarks. And as the US Patent and Trademark Office, this is one of my most favorite topics. And I'll tell you why. Because anyone who is undertaking an endeavor to start, build, and grow a business, uh, anyone who is looking to bring a product to the marketplace or a service to the marketplace, you are going to have something protectable by a trademark. So nearly all of us in any undertaking are going to have something protectable by a copyright. Because as you just saw, anytime we write uh, a paper, a letter, uh, do any work of art, it's protectable by a copyright. Uh, anyone undertaking a business or commercializing a product is going to have something protectable by a trademark. Patents are a little bit less likely, but certainly something we're going to talk about today here in just a moment. But again, every business is going to have something protectable by a trademark and trademarks can bring exceptional value. And I think you'll see why as we have our conversation. What is a trademark? A trademark is any word, name, symbol, or device, or any combination thereof used to identify and distinguish goods and services. It's an indicator of their source. And as you can see in this slide, there is the TM, the SM, and the R with a circle. What is the difference between those? When you see someone using a TM or an SM, an SM being an indicator of a service mark, although most people use a TM or the circle with the R, a TM generally indicates that someone has either a common law or a state trademark, meaning that they have not federally registered it with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Now, why would one go the route of making a federal registration? It's a little bit like the conversation we just had about registering your copyright with the US Copyright Office. By registering it with the US Patent and Trademark Office, you're going to get to take advantage of a lot more opportunities and highlight your brand in ways that are going to be very beneficial. Um, also, if you are working uh, in uh, national commerce, commerce across the states, you are going to want to seek that federally registered trademark. Perhaps where one is just working on a very local level, uh, one has a business that only that works within a state, within a certain smaller geography, maybe a, straight, a state trademark might be the way to go. This slide also provides some great examples of some very recognizable trademarks that I think many of us have seen. It is suggested that any given day of the week, we interact with at least 1,500 trademarks in a day. And I would suggest if you take a trip to the grocery store, you're going to see a whole lot more than that. So what do trademarks offer? Trademarks offer something for both the, the seller, the producer of the goods and services, as well as the general public. They provide brand recognition. They provide the opportunity for a seller, for a creator, to distinguish their goods or services from their competitors in the marketplace. Again, going back to our grocery store example, think about when one travels down the cereal aisle. One can distinguish the different types of cereals by their their names, whether it's Kellogg's, whether it's Post, whether it's General Mills, and then of course the name of the cereal itself. It also provides a public notice of ownership. Having a trademark can provide individuals with the exclusive right to let people know that they have registered this trademark. Um, by having a federally registered trademark, you also provide avail yourself of the right to enforce nationally and bring legal action. And the right to record that mark with customs, again, seeking to combat counterfeiting 
and false goods coming in that can confuse the public. Uh, additionally, providing publication in the U.S. trademark database puts the public on notice that you have registered this and that it is not available for use by others without seeking your permission. So again, what is the definition of a trademark? Any word, slogan, symbol, design, or combination thereof that identifies the source of goods or services and distinguishes them from those of another party. So here are some examples. Going back to that great American company, Coca-Cola, they have a portfolio of trademarks, word marks, comp uh, composite marks, special form marks, design marks. There are also non-traditional trademarks, things that can be sounds, colors, or smells. How many of us recognize the saying, what can Brown do for you? I think for most of us, we quickly uh, envision the UPS truck pulling up in our driveway uh, and that brown suited uh, employee who's delivering packages to our front door. What can Brown do for you distinguishes those parcel services from others that are working in that field, whether it's the US Postal Service or FedEx. What can Brown do for you certainly uh, is an identifier of goods and services. When selecting a trademark for your business, we strongly encourage you to go the route of a strong trademark, which is going to protect you. Um, and we would encourage the use of a fanciful or arbitrary trademark even a suggestive trademark. As one goes down the sliding scale, descriptive trademarks are less effective and then generic, of course, cannot be protected as a US trademark. So what are some examples of strong marks? Fanciful words are invented words, words like Xerox, Microsoft, Cisco, words that outside of serving as a trademark have no meaning. Arbitrary trademarks are actual words, but don't convey any association with the goods and services. Apple for computers, BlackBerry for IT services, uh, Gap for clothing. While those have a dictionary meaning, they, uh, when used as a trademark, do not represent that actual dictionary meaning. And then of course, suggestive. They suggest a quality or intended desire or effect. Weak marks, again, stay away from these when creating your trademarks for your business. Descriptive words are designs that describe the goods or services. While you can receive a federally registered trademark for a descriptive mark, it's not encouraged. It's not the strongest trademark. Uh, and certainly if you are using generic terminology, we will not issue you a federally registered trademark. So again, why register? Um, there's a lot of benefits. This is similar to our conversation with respect to copyrights. Um, it allows you to use that circle with the R. Again, that's providing public notice. It's providing notice to your competitors that you have secured this as a federally registered trademark can be used as a basis for obtaining registration in a foreign country, helps to prevent importation of infringing goods, statutory damages and attorney's fees, many, many benefits to federally registering with the US Patent and Trademark Office. So let's get to patents. I know many of you uh, participating today are engineers, scientists, people working in a field where you might be cr creating something which could be protected by a US patent. So what in fact is a patent? Oh, and I apologize, before we do so, uh, I did not tell you one of the great benefits of a trademark, and that is its duration. So trademarks, once one secures a trademark, they are good for 10 years and can be renewed um, uh, on a 10 year basis, as long as the mark is used in commerce. So trademarks like trade secrets can last forever if you continue to use that mark in commerce and continue to renew it with the US Patent and Trademark Office. My apologies. So back to patents. So what is a patent? A patent is the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the claimed invention, namely your invention, it is for a limited period of time, as we saw in that language of the Constitution. Um, that limited period of time is 20 years from the date of filing for utility and plant patents and 15 years for the, from the date of issuance for design patents. So keep that in mind. Patents, like other forms of intellectual property, are what we call territorial. They only protect you within the country that issues you that right. So it's important to know if you are going to be uh, selling your product uh, globally, if you are going to be manufacturing globally, or your competitors are located across the globe, you are going to want to consider seeking international patent protection. Um, and that's done on a country by country basis. And anecdotally, it is suggested that you want to protect uh, your intellectual property, again, in those countries where you are selling, your competitors are located, and you are manufacturing. Just an anecdotal thought. 
So the types of patents, there are three types of patents, utility design and plant. As I said, utility and plant are good for 20 years from the date of filing and design patents are good for 15 years from the date of issuance. Just as we talked about an intellectual property portfolio, which can be made up of patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, one might have a patent portfolio because one might have multiple forms of patents in your portfolio, particularly with respect to utility and design. If one is creating an article of manufacture, you may choose to protect the way it works, the way it functions, and then also protect the way it appears. Uh, design patents have an incredible value, so I encourage people to not dismiss them as some lower form of patent protection. So is your idea eligible for protection? Well, in order to be eligible for protection as set out by US patent law, it must fall within one of the statutory classes of invention, that it is a process, a machine, manufactured composition of matter, or an improvement thereof. Today, 99% of patents are issued for improvements in processes, machines, manufacturers, composition of matter, and perhaps 1% are for truly disruptive technologies. But with that said, the US patent system is perhaps the greatest repository of technological invention that the world has ever known and great, a great, great building block for future invention. So what are some of the hurdles to patenting? Your invention not only has to fall with one of the, within one of the statutory classes of uh, eligible subject matter, but your invention must be new or novel, meaning it has not been described in the prior art or previously published publications that are pertinent to the patentability of your invention. It must also be non-obvious that the differences between your invention and the prior art were not obvious to someone in the field, just not an obvious variation on something which already exists. And your invention must have utility. And that's a pretty low bar to, for patenting. Um, novel and non-obvious are certainly the, the tougher hurdles to overcome, but utility is part of the US patent law. So what is not patentable? Well, as I said, we were gonna circle back to, can one patent an idea? And the answer is no. And what do I mean by that? I'll give you a quick example. I have a great idea, or so I think. I would love to patent a time machine because I would love to go back in history and meet people like Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman. Now, do I have an invention or do I have an idea? I have an idea because in order to file a US patent application that can be examined and result in a US patent, one must be in such possession of your invention that you can describe it with such specificity that others can make and use your invention. I have no idea how to create a time machine that can take me back in time to meet remarkable people. So I could not file an application which could receive and undergo examination. So it must be able to be developed into a new, not obvious and useful machine manufacturer process or combination composition of matter. Um, now with that said, does one have to have a working prototype? And the answer is no. One must just be in such possession of the invention that it can be disclosed with specificity in your application. Additionally, you cannot patent natural phenomenon or abstract ideas. So what is the path to a patent? Well, obviously it starts with an idea and that idea again may be an improvement on an existing technology or it may be something incredibly disruptive, something we've never seen or heard of before. And that's where it's ex extremely exciting. So one has the opportunity to seek protection of that idea by filing a provisional patent application, though not required. One can start with the non-provisional patent application. It is that non-provisional patent application which is examined by a US patent examiner. We have over 8,000 trained and uh, very proficient uh, engineers and scientists doing that work. The non-provisional is what can result in a US patent. Um, but let's talk about the difference between the provisional patent application and the non-provisional, because oftentimes this is an area where I hear some confusion. The provisional patent application is actually um, kind of a, a relatively recent introduction to the US patent system. Uh, it allows someone to put something on file with the US Patent and Trademark Office for a low cost of entry and a low barrier of entry. By filing a provisional patent application, one can secure for a year the opportunity to use the term patent pending, to have something on file with the US Patent and Trademark Office, and to begin talking to others. Maybe you need others to uh, do some market research, or maybe you need to be talking to others about 
financially investing in your concept, financially investing in your product. You can do so by having that provisional patent application on file. Now, with that said, it is a one-year placeholder. If you want to take advantage of pursuing that and seeking a U.S. patent, within that one-year time frame, you want to file that non-provisional patent application because that is what will be examined by the U.S. examiner. Um, under both a provisional and a non-provisional, one can use the term patent pending, but again, it is only that non-provisional that will be examined by a U.S. patent examiner. So keep in mind, uh, there's a lot of great information on our website about the provisional patent application. If one thinks you want to pursue this, by having that provisional patent application and then seeking the non-provisional and receiving U.S. patent, one effectively is giving themselves a 21-year patent term. So another added benefit. So once one files that non-provisional patent application, what happens? All too often I hear from applicants that um, they're fearful of the process. They think of the USPTO as a black box agency where they file their patent application and then hold their breath and hope for the best. We certainly don't want that to be the viewpoint of the office. We want the US Patent and Trademark Office to be seen as a collaborator. We want to be seen as an office of collaboration and communication. We want to work with you to issue you a U.S. patent that you can take to the bank and not to the courthouse, which is exactly what you want. So we are basically two sides of the same coin, I like to say. So when you file your application with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, it is going to be assigned to an examiner. And it's going to be assigned to a patent examiner who has a background in technology that is pertinent to your invention. They will review that application, they will read it thoroughly, they will search the prior art, and then they will begin the process of communication and collaboration with you. That will come in the form of written communications and perhaps might even include an interview if you and your patent attorney choose to participate through an interview. There may be some things called rejections or objections along the way, but you will have the opportunity to interact with that patent examiner. And this is perhaps a great place to weave in another audience question. And that was, can a patent be changed once filed but before granted? And that's a great question because that's exactly what we're talking about right now. If one has filed a patent application during the prosecution of that patent application, there's going to be a, a, probably a lot of back and forth between the applicant and the examiner and the patent attorney if a patent attorney is used. And that's where there are going to likely be amendments to the claims, amendments to the specification, perhaps even amendments to the drawings. The word of caution is, though, one cannot add any new matter once an application is filed. One can refine and amend. One cannot add any new matter into an application once it's undergoing prosecution. Um, hopefully, throughout this process, we arrive at issuing you a U.S. patent. And just know that we have issued over 11 million U.S. patents since our inception in 1790. So I know we're going to be running short on time, but I want to jump to uh, touching on some USPTO resources uh, very quickly before we round out our time together. Um, before I do so, I will answer one additional question that came in from the audience, and that is, if a patent is filed, which reads on previous patents by the same entity, can the patent be granted with special provisions? That's a little bit of a niche question, but I'm happy to take that one on as well. There is something called a terminal disclaimer practice uh, where uh, an applicant can file uh, related applications, divisionals or continuations, which may require a terminal disclaimer. Um, and this is where one may have to disclaim part of a patent term, but just um, if interested in this specific topic, I encourage you to visit our website, put in the search box, terminal disclaimer, and you'll see a lot of dialogue there on that. Speaking of our website, I wanna to turn to our website now. For those of you who have not visited us at www.uspto.gov, I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, and this is what uh, the landing page of our homepage looks like uh, today. Um, because our website is so rich with resources, I wanna provide a few uh, inroads uh, as places you might wanna start. Um, we always uh, feature an inspiring journey of innovation, and today we are currently featuring Beulah Louise Henry, uh, also known as Lady Edison. Lady Edison uh, had around uh, 100 inventions to her name, although uh, she patented approximately 50 of them in her lifetime, a wide array of technologies, some of which we still enjoy today. 
For those of you, again, who are visiting us for the very first time, I encourage you to start with our learning and resources pull down tab available from the top toolbar. There you'll find information uh, for inventors, entrepreneurs, startups, kids, and teachers. Uh, I also, knowing that many of you are, are located across the nation, encourage you to visit the USPTO in your region area, where you'll find a map of the US and be able to find resources that are specific to your state or region. Turning to that, you will see uh, a map of the US. And this just calls out uh, what I've already mentioned to you, that the USPTO headquarters is located in Alexandria, Virginia. And we have regional offices in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose. We are preparing to reopen our offices to the public, and we welcome you coming in to meet with our staff in person, to use our patent and trademark search systems, uh, and to visit us. We love to have visitors in our building and look forward to the opportunity to host you yet again. I will mention that in our Alexandria headquarters, we also house the National Inventors Hall of Fame Museum. As I mentioned, uh, our state resource pages, this is one just providing a quick glimpse of the District of Columbia and what you would find on that page. Finding free patent and trademark legal assistance, PTRCs, any inventors uh, organizations in your area. We do have a YouTube channel on YouTube that provides USPTO recorded programs. For any of you who are a visual learner, um, I encourage you to visit our YouTube channel. You'll find a wealth of information there, a wealth of different recordings on a wide variety of topics. Similarly, we have a subscription center, which can provide a great deal of information dropped directly into your inbox on a wide array of topics, patents, trademarks, copyrights. Uh, and I encourage you to sign up for one or all 12 of these subscriptions. We do not spam you. We only provide information when we have something significant to say. I would encourage you, again, under that Learning and Resources pull-down tab, to visit our USPTO events page, where we have multiple events going every day of the week, Monday through Friday. Um, and I'm going to provide you with an insight to three upcoming, just to give you some diversity. And that's at the very end of our slides today. Uh, but again, this is a wide array of events. These are all free events, and they're on a, a wealth of topics. For our startups, and we know many of you in the audience today are probably uh, knee deep in a startup or considering creating a startup, perhaps to commercialize a technology that you have invented. We have created a startup resources page and I encourage you to put startup into the search box um, because this is where you will find a one stop shop for resources for startups, patents, trademarks, startup assistance, and then a link back to that events page that I mentioned. Our Inventors Assistance Center is something which provides information and direct assistance Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 8. For those of you who are starting down the road of seeking a patent, perhaps already uh, in prosecution, or perhaps even after you've already received your patent. This is staffed by retired USPTO employees who love to take your calls and emails. Similarly, we have a Trademark Assistance Center that can help you prior to filing, throughout the prosecution process, and even after you receive your US trademark. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a quick minute, I know we're almost out of time, to reference our patent pro bono program. As a result of the America Invents Act of 2011, Congress urged the US Patent and Trademark Office to work with legal organizations across the nation to stand up state and regional pro bono programs such that financially under-resourced inventors were not leaving inventions on the kitchen table or garage workbench, that we could help bring those technologies forward. So we now have programs across the 50 states. Now there are certain requirements uh, that must be met in order to take advantage of these limited services. Um, and that is, in fact, you must be financially under-resourced, as you can see here. Um, even if part of the pro bono program, you do have to pay USPTO filing fees and costs you do have to know, demonstrate a knowledge of the patent system by either filing a provisional patent application or taking our online course and have to have more than a mere idea. We want these resources to go to individuals who are going to take a, a, a product and commercialize it, create a business and create jobs. So as you can see from this map, there is a, a pro bono program in every part of our nation, again, either a state or regional program. We similarly have uh, law school clinics, which also facilitate uh, providing reduced cost or free legal services in the area of patents and trademarks. 
you can see we have these resources ac available across the nation. And these can be found by using that USPTO in your region page. It'll list for you which schools are in your area, which are accepting clients, and which ones perform in the area of patents or trademarks or both. Last but not least, I want to reference our Patent and Trademark Resource Centers, or our PTRCs. This is a network of over 80 libraries located nationwide where there is one or more librarian gifted and trained in patent and trademark searching. They can help facilitate you creating a high quality patent or trademark search such that you know whether or not to pursue your application. Um, so I encourage you to uh, visit one of these resources. They are available in, in publicly available libraries, oftentimes at colleges and universities. So last but not least, uh, some other additional links for resources. And as I said, just to whet your appetite, some of the upcoming events, one taking place today, diversify, diversifying your market or supply chain, copyright protection. Tomorrow, we are teaching a class to learn online how our patent examiners approach obviousness rejections, which is a, a complex area and one which provides perhaps the most difficult area for both patent examiners and applicants alike. And then, of course, I want to call to your attention April 26th, which is World Intellectual Property Day. We will be having a virtual online event that I hope you will join in so we can all celebrate World IP Day, the importance and role of intellectual property on a global uh, sphere. So um, I know we're just about out of time. I'm going to jump out of these slides right now and uh, again, welcome your questions if we have time to take some today or certainly encourage you to reach out to myself and my team. Uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can also reach out to me through my USPTO email, which is elizabeth.doherty at uspto.gov. And my colleague Tamika will also place in the chat our Eastern Regional Outreach Office email address so you can reach us there as well. It's been such a pleasure being with you today. Um, I look forward to our receiving your applications for patents and trademarks and I look forward to you navigating the world of intellectual property. Excuse me, I'm sorry, folks. I was I was muted just now. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, ooh, one second uh, for providing your wealth of knowledge. Um, I know it was probably. Uh, I think our audience has a lot of questions. Uh, I know we definitely threw a lot of. Uh, information at them. Um, we do have some questions from the audience right now, folks. Uh, I will have uh, we'll provide ten minutes uh, to get um, as many of your questions as answered as possible. So, Elizabeth, this first question, uh, George asked during the live stream: Would you need to get permission to include copywritten work in a new comp compilation copywritten work? Um, you know, George, that is a great question and one that I would strongly encourage that you to put in a call to the U.S. Copyright Office because they, similar to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, have a helpline which can answer these questions directly or also seek the assistance of a copyright attorney. Um, I hesitate to give what might constitute legal advice with respect to this question um, because in all likelihood, you probably would need to, but again, it, it's probably a case-by-case -case dependent situation, but a great question. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. This next question, Dwight asks, does the, does a seeker of trade secrets have to disclose the secret to the USPTO? So uh, thank you, Dwight, for that question. Uh, keep in mind, again, trade secrets, which are, are something which is maintained as a secret. So trade secrets are protected by the Uniform Trade Secret Act and by generally contract law between an employer and employees. So there should be no disclosure of a trade secret to anyone except those that you have that confidential relationship with, that you have that protected uh, conversation with about protecting the secrecy of that invention. Now, if one is seeking a patent, um, you would obviously have to disclose uh, in your application exactly what the parameters are of your invention. So uh, again, trade secrets and, and patents are very different trade secrets are not handled by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you for that question, Dwight. This next question, uh, Don asks, if you take notes from a lecture, what must one do to use them in a book? Okay, interesting question. Um, so uh, your notes are obviously your creative product. 
um, and you are securing them in a fixed and tangible medium, uh, I guess I'm curious as to the actual step of taking them and placing them into a book. Um, by merely securing them in a fixed medium, whether that's a written notebook or an electronic notebook, you have secured a copyright. How you go about actually producing those or translating those into a book is, is in fact a step completely outside of copyright. Good to know. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thanks for the question, Don. Um, this next question, uh, Doug asks, so which mark do you use if you have applied for a trademark but not received approval from the USPTO yet? So one would use the TM until we issue you that federally registered trademark, which is when you can begin using the circle with the R. Um, again, uh, TM also can indicate that someone has uh, either a state trademark or a common law trademark, but it's only once you receive your registration certificate from the US Patent and Trademark Office that one can use the circle with the R. Great question, Doug. Philip asks, what are the costs of registering a trademark? Philip, uh, I appreciate you asking that question because uh, I will say with respect to both patents and trademarks, I would strongly encourage applicants to look to our website and to actually type into the search box fee schedule because our fees are updated um, on a regular basis. And when I say that, um, they don't always go up. Sometimes our fees actually go down where we are able to uh, make a process more efficient or perhaps uh, simplify a process or procedure. The cost of seeking a US trademark is certainly uh, is variable in that one must apply for um, the respective classes of goods and services that one is applying for. So it depends, uh, the cost of a trademark depends upon how many different classes one is applying for. So let's say, for example, your mark is going to be used um, as uh, an indicator of not only your business, but it's going to be produced on t-shirts, hats, and uh, portfolios. That may necessitate you filing in a number of different classes of goods. So for each class of goods one is applying for use of that trademark, there is going to be an additional fee. So it is a sliding scale, um, but keep in mind, it is relatively inexpensive. And Philip, uh, we've just added the uh, the link to the comment section. So you do have access to the fee, fee schedule as Elizabeth mentioned. Thanks for the question. Uh, this next question, I filed a tra trademark application last year. I received an email that it'll be published on April 26th of this year, I'm assuming. What does this mean and how does it relate with approval? Prince, great question as well. And thank you for uh, filing that trademark application. We're excited to receive it. What that means is it has been published um, for uh, public awareness and public opposition. Trademark applications are published for a duration of time in which the public has the opportunity to provide feedback on that trademark. Uh, and this is in case uh, perhaps we are unaware that, uh, that a similar mark exists, either a state or common law trademark, and also for other trademark brand owners to provide comment and feedback as to whether the US Patent and Trademark Office should issue that trademark registration. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this next question, if I invent something while I'm working for a company, can I file a patent? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends probably in large part upon your employee contract. Um, it, it, it is probably something that is in the fine print of your employee contract um, because oftentimes a company uh, may say that if you've done it on company time using company resources, that that intellectual property then becomes um, the ownership of the company. Uh, so it really depends. It depends on how that's been set forth in your employee contract. And if not in your employee contract, uh, it also may depend again on whether you did it on company time and using company resources. So I'd want to navigate that very carefully and, and have a conversation um, with the company that you work with uh, but perhaps first and foremost, look in that employee handbook and see if they've called it out. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hope that answered your question. I know we also uh, had some other uh, audience members chiming on that. So thank you for your uh, thank you for all your feedback. This next question, Henry asks, I have some patents. One thing I never heard was that once you get the patent, every number of years you have to pay a fee to keep it. So I guess the question is, is there a time limit on uh, intellectual property? So, uh, Henry, I'm so glad you brought up the concept of maintenance fees, and I wish we could have touched on it um, with our, our presentation. We just have limited time to get to all of the important concepts. And you're right. This is something that oftentimes people don't recognize. In fact, I had a stakeholder once say to me, I got a letter in the mail and they wanted money for my patent and it must have been a scam. Well, the, the answer is no, because there is something called maintenance fees and maintenance fees are charged at three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years. And I'll tell you why. The US patent system is designed, and I think really beautifully, to have a low cost of entry. Um, recognizing that uh, oftentimes inventors and innovators are not making money when they file that first US patent application. We keep the cost of entry low so that it is not a barrier to people to join the system. However, we hope that once you are issued your US patent, and you start and build and grow that business, that with time, your business starts to succeed and starts to enjoy the benefit of that intellectual property right in that issued US patent. So you, pay, you are requested to pay maintenance fees at three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years, and they get progressively larger under the assumption that your company is doing better and better the longer it is, is, is going on. Now, with that said, um, one can always choose to not pay a maintenance fee, but by not paying a maintenance fee, um, you are no longer keeping your patent in force and you are in fact letting your patent go into the public domain where everyone can use your technology without your permission. Um, and, and oftentimes that decision is made, sometimes it's an easy decision, sometimes it's not. Sometimes a company says, you know what, we're no longer pursuing this technology or time has passed by this technology. Um, and they choose to no longer keep a patent in force. But in order to enjoy that 20 year term, one must pay the maintenance fees. Thank you for that insight, Elizabeth. Henry, hope that answered your question. Uh, we have time for uh, just a few more questions. Um, this question from, uh, excuse me, from Skylar. How do you patent licenses commonly work when multiple parties are listed as inventors? Uh, Skylar, great question for your patent attorney. Um, and there is also something called the Licensing Executive Society or LES, and they oftentimes can help people to navigate those patent licensing issues. Um, once a patent issues by the US Patent and Trademark Office, it is really out of our domain. Uh, enforcement falls to the patent owners and licensing is one of those concepts. Licenses can be navigated a number of different ways, particularly where there's multiple parties. So this is where uh, the patent attorney who helped you to secure that intellectual property right could be very helpful. Or again, uh, finding someone from an organization such as uh, the Licensing Executive Society. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Walsh asks, which method of IP would apply to protecting a logo of an organization which may not sell or offer a service? Well, so one would still be seeking a trademark um, uh, because well, one may not be uh, actively selling a product or a service, um, even if one is an organization, let's say for example, a nonprofit, which is doing um, great things. Let's, let's think about maybe a community food bank. Um, they're not selling anything, but they are in fact offering a service. They are offering free uh, or reduced cost food services to a community. So they, in fact, are offering a service. So uh, bottom line, if one is having something which is the indication of an organization, uh, a trademark is really going to be the method of intellectual property that one wants to seek to, to protect that logo. Thank you. This final question, uh, Carson asks, what are the steps one must take to become a patent attorney? Carson, I'm so glad you asked that question because we are looking to diversify the field of individuals who are participating in the IP field. Now, in order to become a patent attorney, one must go to law school. Although I do want to also share that there is something called a patent agent. 
patent agents are not attorneys, but they are able to assist with patent applications. So let's talk first about patent attorneys and patent agents both. They both must have a degree in one of the recognized sciences. And you can find on our website, on our website, the what recognized uh, sciences uh, entail one are, are, are included to be considered for the career of patent attorney or patent agent. Um, and it's, it's pretty wide. It's not just uh, electrical engineering and computer science, um, because we do also have, you know, the aspect of designs and uh, the aspect of business method patents. But one must have a recognized degree, recognized by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And then in order to be a patent attorney, of course, go to law school. Uh, patent agents do not have to go to law school, but they have a degree in one of the recognized sciences. But one must then also pass a certification exam with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Our Office of Enrollment and Discipline, recognizing that patent practice is such a specialized field, uh, they require patent attorneys, patent agents to pass a uh, specialized exam, sort of almost like a bar exam, but it is administered by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to ascertain that these individuals are, are, are fully skilled and aware of the rules and laws of patent practice. So again, to be a patent attorney, one must have a degree in one of the recognized sciences, must, must be uh, an attorney having passed a bar exam, and must also pass our Office of Enrollment and Discipline exam. Um, I mentioned the patent agents because oftentimes law firms um, hire and have in their their stable of uh, professionals both patent attorneys and patent agents. And sometimes a patent agent might come at a reduced cost and they can do much of the patent prosecution work that a patent attorney can do. However, a patent agent cannot represent you in court. court. So if you found yourself, uh, unfortunately, in a situation where you're having to protect your IP rights in court, one would have to seek the assistance of a patent attorney. Uh, we recognize that uh, one is not required by law to use a patent attorney or patent agent. One can file a patent application uh, as an individual, um, but we also recognize that there is a certain level of complexity in filing a patent application and prosecuting a patent application. So we strongly encourage the use of a patent attorney or patent agent. Fantastic. Carson, I hope that uh, hope that uh, answer helped. Well, folks, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, we really appreciate your great questions. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today and giving our audience insight to the kinds of uh, intellectual property and the differences between each of them. Thank you, Jonathan. It was such a pleasure to be with you and to be with this IEEE audience. I know my team and I look forward to the rest of the parts in this multiple part series, and we look forward to joining you in providing this valuable information and education. Thank you so much for the collaboration, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We look forward to receiving your applications. It definitely looking forward to everyone. And thank you uh, for tuning in and for your great questions. Again, uh, we know there were some issues with the YouTube live stream in the beginning, and we, we really appreciate your uh, patience as we work to get that resolved. Uh, these webinars will be archived on our channels and will be available on demand after the broadcast, including our YouTube stream. As mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we will be sending a short survey to all registrants after this event and would love your feedback regarding this webinar. Make sure to register for our other upcoming USPTO webinars in the coming months. We've posted the links to the webinar series in the chat section. Check back daily on our social media for future live stream updates, and we hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone.